Welcome back from break. <clears throat> now we are going to move on to the concepts of chapter 12, where we are going to continue talking about organic chemistry. Now we are going to focus on the functional group alcohols, thiols, ethers, aldehydes, and ketones. Let's first review out of the family of heteroatoms, alcohols, phenols, thiols, and ethers. So an alcohol, as we learn in chapter 11, is going to be the functional group in which we have a carbon atom, okay, attached to an OH group. A phenol is actually part of the alcohol family. It's just that that R group or that rest of the molecule is going to be a benzene ring, okay? So don't think that actually phenols are going to be just a separate member or its own functional group. It is actually part of the alcohol family, okay? Now, where do we see alcohols in real life? Well, as you guys can see here in the figure that we have on the right side of the slide, alcohol is actually one of the byproducts that certain organisms produce. And us as humans, we have certain food products thanks to these organisms producing these compounds out of them processing uh, you know, some biomolecules. So for example, Alcohol can be obtained, as you can see, via the process of the conversion of sugar in the form of glucose. That goes through a biochemical pathway and that sugar turns into the biomolecule called pyruvate. Then pyruvate sequentially go through other biochemical processes, okay, at least two more, because pyruvate um, goes through the process of the Krebs cycle, then after that, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, but specifically in the organism Saccharomyces, and for those of you that have never heard the word Saccharomyces, this is actually yeast. Yeast can take all of that sugar, okay? all that glucose, okay, that, that sugar in the form of glucose, and through the process of fermentation, it's what gives rise to products like beer or wine, okay? And in the process of that yeast taking that sugar, okay, and out of the sugar's glucose and biochemically processing it, as you can see, it forms an alcohol. So the drinking alcohol that you may consume via wine or beer is actually produced from a sugar, okay? This process is very interesting. And when I lived in Canada, this is what I was actually working on because Yeast, since it is one of those um, organisms that, again, can be utilized for beer and wine, biochemically, yeast, even though they don't have a brain, it actually has chemical reactions in order to understand sugar and memorize which sugar they were in. More importantly, when I was uh, doing my postdoc in Canada, we actually had a collaboration with a lab in Belgium. And over there, they were, because in Belgium, there's a lot of beer that is produced, also a lot of chocolate. Um, the lab that we were collaborating with were actually understanding all these chemical reactions to actually put in certain biomolecules in the yeast to give a different flavor profile um, for their chocolates and beer. Um, just utilizing biochemical processes and understanding that at the end of the day, what you're producing is alcohol, okay? So this is a very interesting process, okay? 
In San Diego, we have a lot of breweries. For those of you that are of legal drinking age and may have noticed around all the breweries that we have around. And there's actually um, a laboratory that have their own brewery, White Slab. And they have different strains of yeast to produce different flavors in their beer. So this is a very interesting process. And as you guys can see, all based on chemistry, okay? Now, we also have the other two functional groups, thiols and ethers. When it comes to an ether, we know that an ether is going to be when you have carbon chains both attach to a single bond oxygen, okay? Now, why are ethers important? Well, to just give you a little bit of historical background, ether as was actually the first anesthetic that was utilized, okay, uh, successfully in operations. As you can see, ether was um, the first real anesthetic and even though it was invented around 1535, okay, it wasn't, <clears throat> that's funny, um, ethers, okay, were not used until the 1800s as an anesthetic. Before in surgeries, there were people, they were using alcohols or opium or other substances, but they didn't work in every patient. So if it, it wasn't until ether started getting utilized, then, then it was more effective as an anesthetic. So poor people that got surgeries before then. Um, and understand that around 1846, then ether was being used more successfully. Right now, ether is not used, but understand that you know in the mid 1800s, that was what was used as an anesthetic. Um, <laughs> specifically. No, I don't know that fact. Why was it? To be honest with you, in the lab, we mostly use it as a solvent because of its properties in water. I don't know if there was a medical use for ether um, before uh, or in like in 1535. I, I, I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, when it comes to thiols, we learned that a thiol is where a carbon chain is attached to an SH group, okay? And you may think like, okay, why are these sulfurs important? Well, in the body, we're going to learn in later chapters that we have what are called amino acids. And amino acids have a side chain. And one of the amino acids that have a side chain that it is actually a thiol is called a cysteine. Okay, now cysteines, as we're going to see in this chapter, can actually via an oxidation reaction, you see the arrow point pointing down, can form what is called a disulfide bond, okay? And disulfide bonds are very important in the structure of proteins, okay? So for example, a person like me that has very nice, beautiful, tight curls, which I love them. A lot of people are always questioning, it's like, how, do you love having curly hair? Yes, because I don't have to brush it every day. Um, the reason why my curls are tight, you know, the way that they are, is because of disulfide bonds. Okay, so if I do modifications to my hair, like if I try to make it straight, which I typically don't, I don't like my hair straight, um, or let's say that I try to reshape my curls, what I'm doing is an interplay of those disulfide bonds, okay? If I reduce them by different chemical methods, then that's how you're able to reshape, you know, the, um, the proteins in your hair. So whenever you get your hair did, people, basically what's happening is that there's a chemical reaction that is happening in your hair, okay? Especially if you get a perm or something like that, or you get, what is that called? Like, um, is it called Brazilian blowout? Like, I think that people put this 
you know, all keratin treatments and all that kind of stuff. All of that are chemical modifications to the structures of the disulfide bonds in the hair. But understand that disulfide bonds are very important in many of the proteins that we have in our body. Now, it is important that now that I introduce these functional groups, understand that out of these three functional groups, alcohols, ethers, and thiols, we're only going to learn how to name the first two. In other words, alcohols and ethers. So now let's move on and learn how we are going to name alcohol molecules. As I mentioned to you guys when I introduced organic chemistry, we are going to learn that it doesn't matter which functional group we're talking about, we're always using the same first skill. We're going to find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms, okay? Now, once you have found that parent chain, you can just pick the alkane name, and then if you have an alcohol, you're going to remove the E in the alkane name, and now the ending is going to be O-L, because you're dealing with an alcohol. We're going to number the chain starting from the end that is nearest the OH group, okay? And then we're going to give the location and the name for all the substituents relative to the carbon atom that is holding that OH group. Don't forget, we have already learned a set of rules for whenever we're dealing with one substituent, two substituents, multiple substituents that are the same, multiple substituents that are different, all of those rules carry into these functional groups, okay? So I know you guys are pro at this. We're gonna practice naming alcohols and then we're going to practice how to draw them. Let's get started with these practice problems and let's utilize the chat. How many carbons are in the longest carbon chain of this structure? The first one in the top, how many carbons? Are in the longest carbon chain. Excellent. You guys got this. Six carbons. So my alkane name for six carbons is hexane. Okay. Now, hexane, because I'm dealing with an alcohol, I'm not going to call it hexane. I'm going to call it great job, Alexa. Exactly. Hexanol. So the name of my parent chain is going to be hexanol, okay? Now, I'm going to number my carbon atoms in my parent chain starting from the end that is nearest to the carbon atom that is holding the OH. So when I'm numbering this, I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, you need to give the location of which carbon atom is holding the OH, especially if you have three or more carbons. If you only have two carbons, your OH is only going to be in carbon one. But if you have three or more carbons, you need to get the location of the carbon that is holding the OH. So to represent that, we're going to put a two before my parent chain. We have one substituent in this molecule. So what is the location and the name for that substituent? Great job, Yesenia. This is 5-methyl-2-hexanol. So take a moment. What is the name of the first skeletal structure in the bottom? Let's put it in the chat. Find the longest carbon chain, number your carbon atoms, starting from the end that is nearest the OH. <clears throat> Write the parent chain, which is the last word, and add as a prefix of that, the location and the name of your substituent.
I don't see five carbons. Count your carbons again. Excellent. Thank you, Gia. And Divya, great job. There is one, two, three, four carbon atoms. Bromine is not a carbon. Remember that whenever we're trying to find the parent chain is the longest carbon chain. So from that, we know that this is butanol of carbon two. We have the OH. Since there's one, two, three, four, a carbon four, I have a bromo group. Okay, that's where the name comes from. Now, alcohols can be cyclic, okay? So what is the name of that cyclic system that we have in that alcohol? What is the alkane name? What is the alkane name of that cyclic? system that we have in that cyclic alcohol. Great job, that is cyclopentane, okay? So similar to what we did in rule number one in step one, this is cyclopentane. So if your alcohol is cyclic, this is cyclopentanol, okay? Now, if your alcohol is cyclic, then understand that carbon number one is the carbon that is holding the OH. That's carbon number one. Now, we need to number the other carbons in the ring to give the other substituent the lowest number. So do we go clockwise or counterclockwise? Great, counterclockwise. Two, three, four, five. In a cyclic alcohol, we do not say one cyclopentanol because the OH is always going to be on carbon one. So you don't have to put the one before the cyclopentanol. Okay? Now you just place as a prefix of that the name and the location of the substituent. So what is the location and the name of the substituent in this alcohol? Great, that's two propyl. Cyclopentanol. Great job, Adeline. Yes, that is the name of that. Let's practice naming some alcohols. Okay. Let's go through this one, which is a condensed structure. Let's put it in the chat. What will be the name of this alcohol? Let's recount those carbons. It's not prop, is three. This is butanol. Where's the location of my OH? Remember that if your alcohol has three carbons or more in a straight chain, we need to give the location of the OH. Excellent. This is one butanol because this is carbon one, this is two, this is three, and this is four, okay? Let's do the next one, a skeletal. <clears throat> what would be the name of this alcohol? <clears throat>
I agree with the heptanol. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> so this is two heptanol. Great. Four bromo. Next one. Not pent, it's not five. One, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> Great. And then what are the names of the substituents? And remember, since we have different substituents, we need to put them in alphabetical order. We're missing the H in chloro. If you don't put the H, then that's how you say it in Spanish, chloro. So it's five chloro or ethyl two hexanol. <clears throat> what about this one? What would be the name? Starting with the parent, which is the last word. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, I see a lot of isopropanols. Remember that your substituent doesn't get the OL. It's only the parent chain. So at five, this is isopropyl. That's it. Okay. The OL ending is only to the parent chain. Next, we have a cyclic one. Name of the parent chain. Is based on cyclohexane, yes. Great, cyclohexanol. Remember that cyclobenzol doesn't exist. That's phenol. A benzene ring with OH, that's called phenol. And just because it's a hexagon, that doesn't mean that it is a benzene. There's no lines, there's no circle in it. This is a cyclohexanol. So when it comes to the cyclic alcohols, the carbon that is holding the OH is carbon one. This is two. Three, four, five, six. We have two substituents. Excellent.
three comma five dichlorocyclohexanol. Questions, naming alcohols. <clears throat> This one should be straightforward. This is cyclohexanol. Let's go from name to structure. First one, three methyl, three pentanol. How many carbons in the longest carbon chain for this alcohol? Great job. You guys are getting the hang of it. Five. If this is one, and this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five. Okay. So as you can see, the number three before pentanol tells me where my OH is, which is on carbon three. Then we also have another substituent on three, which is a methyl group. Now we put in the hydrogens. How many hydrogens on carbon number one? What about carbon number two? What about carbon number three? Carbon number four. You guys got this. Great. Carbon number five. Let's now write the skeletal, carbon number one, two, three, four, five. And then I have two substituents on three. I have an OH and I have a methyl. Remember that the hydrogen in the OH, since it's bonded to the oxygen, that's why it shows up in the skeletal. The carbons in the hydrogens on the rest of the atom, because they're bonded to carbon, they do not show up in the skeletal. So that is the skeletal structure of that name. Next one, cyclobutanol. We know that but in the cyclic system, how many carbons does that cyclic alkane have? Great. Four. We have four carbons connected to each other. Okay. Why there's not a number to tell me where the OH is? Because I can place it anywhere. Okay. Let's say that I place it here. Then that establishes that in my structure, this is carbon one. And then I can decide to do clockwise or counterclockwise. So let's do clockwise, that's easier. So that means that on carbon two, I have a Cl group. Now I put in my hydrogens. How many hydrogens does carbon number one and carbon number two get? Great. This is a CH, this is a CH. How many hydrogens does carbon number three and carbon number four get? Excellent. When we do the skeletal, remember that this looks like a square. Here is my OH and here is my CL. Questions, naming alcohols. The next thing that we need to know about alcohols is that alcohols can be classified depending on the carbon atoms that are attached to the carbon that is holding the OH, okay? So, <clears throat> as you can see, 
when it comes to the classification, we can classify our, our alcohols as primary alcohols. So a one with that zero in the corner doesn't say one degree or two degree, three degree. No, that's primary, secondary, and tertiary. That's the correct terminology for the classification of our alcohols. So in our primary alcohol, you can see that the carbon that is holding the OH is attached to one carbon chain. In a secondary, Daniel, did you have a question? In a secondary alcohol, my carbon that is holding the OH is attached to two carbon chains. And lastly, if my the carbon that is holding the OH is attached to one, two, three carbon chain, that is known as a tertiary alcohol, okay? So let's go through these examples. Here we have a CH, here there's a CH2, there's a CH2, there's a CH2, CH2, CH2. So this is the carbon that is holding the OH. It is bonded to one, two carbon chains. So let's put it in the chat. What is the classification of this? Excellent, a secondary alcohol. Let's look at the next structure. What is the classification of the next structure? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? One, two, or three? The second molecule, is that primary, secondary, or tertiary? One, two, or three? Let me write in the carbons, because students are still having a hard time with the skeletal. There's a carbon atom with two hydrogens here. There's a carbon atom with one hydrogen. This carbon atom is bonded to one carbon chain. Exactly, this is a primary alcohol. Let's look at the next one. This is a CH, this is a CH2, this is a CH2, CH, CH2, CH. So out of this, this is bonded to one, two carbon chains. Exactly, that is secondary. Look at this one. This is a carbon, this is a CH3, CH3, <clears throat> CH2. CH2, CH3. So this is bonded to one, two, three carbon chains. So this is tertiary. This classification of alcohol, very important when we um, deal with reactions. 
which is we have another set of reactions that we're going to learn in this chapter. So we have reactions in chapter 11, 12, and 14. Okay, questions on the classifications of alcohols. Since there are no questions, let's now move on to learn how to name the next functional group, which is ethers, okay? Ethers are going to be one of the two functional groups that you guys are going to uh, learn how to name just using their common names, okay? In chapter 14, we're going to learn the common names for amines. But for now, we need to learn how to name ethers utilizing their common names, not their IUPAC names. When we are naming ethers, understand that the common names of ethers are going to be several words in a row, okay? You're going to utilize specifically, um, you're going to name each side of the ether as a substituent. As you can see here, to the left, you have a methyl group. To the right, you have a propyl group. You're going to name those substituents and then you're going to place them in alphabetical order. And the last word is going to be ether. So the correct name for this ether is methyl propyl ether. Okay. Let's look at this skeletal structure for an ether. Let me use my, my highlighter tool. What is the name of the group that I highlighted in orange? That's a propyl group. What is the name of the group on the right side? The one that is in purple. That's ethyl, great. So the name of this is going to be three words, ethyl, then propyl, then ether. Okay. Let's try this one. What would be the name of this <clears throat> ether? Count your carbons. And remember that your substituents, you already know the prefixes. And remember, if it's a substituent, it ends in YL. One of the substituents we've seen, we have an ethyl. What's the one on the right? So I agree with you guys, this side is an ethyl. Count the carbons. And it's just the prefix of the number of carbons ending in YL. Great job, Divya. This is a butyl group. But, because there's four carbons, YL, because it's a substituent. Okay, let's put them in alphabetical order. This ether is butyl, ethyl, ether. Okay. <coughs> Let's name this one. <clears throat> Let 
No problem. I'll show you the. One, I. One, two, three, four. That's how we know it's butyl. What about the one that is in the bottom of that? What would be the name of that? Great job. Thank you, Francisco. This is isopropyl. Propyl. Either. Okay. For those of you that need the little extra help this is your isopropyl. This is your propyl. And the whole thing is an ether. That's an ether. It, it just takes practice. Um, if you have five, that will be pentyl. If you have six, that will be hexyl. If you have seven, it's heptyl. If you have eight, octyl. Remember the prefix that you have for the number of carbons ending in while. Yeah, you have to be careful with the skeletal. Skeletals, um, I honestly like them more than condensed just because um, it's easier in my drawing program. Uh, when I draw any molecule, it gives, it, uh, it gives me the structure um, skeletal. And then I have, if I wanna change it to condense, it's going to be um, like extra commands to convert the molecules into skeletal. And most drawing programs or even chemical libraries, all of them take uh, skeletal structures. So that's why. No, you don't count the oxygen. Remember is the carbon chain. Oxygen is not carbon. So for this, the one on the top, right? This is ethyl because there's one, two. Be careful with that. Also, don't let you know your eyes trick you. If you have a chlorine substituent, that's another common mistake that I see in my students that they see a chlorine and they count the chlorine. Specifically in the um, halo alkanes. Um, for those of you that are like, okay, I don't see it. Let me show you. If I give you this, right? Then students say, oh, this is the longest carbon chain is this. Me writing it, it looks more straightforward, but if you see the computer generated one, like let's say that um, it's all condensed. This is a common mistake I see that people say, oh, butyl. And they don't realize that that is a CL, that's not a carbon. So this is actually propane. This is one chloro, two methyl propane. So be careful with that. Don't let your eyes trick you. Let's go back to the ethers. No. A common substituent that we have in the ethers is a benzene ring. And let me establish that 
a benzene ring has a very specific name when it is a substituent. If you see that there is a bond directly to benzene, benzene as a substituent is called a phenyl group or a phenyl group. Now phenol, phenyl, P-H-E-N-Y-L. Okay, so that is a phenyl group. The one on the left, you guys should know by heart now. What is the name of this ether? It starts with isopropyl, great. Excellent. Phenyl ether. Now, there's another substituent that is uh, similar to this, but let me establish what's the difference. And that is this one. Notice that here we have a bond to CH2 and then my benzene. Okay. So there's a CH2 right here, right before the benzene. This group is called a benzyl group, okay? So benzyl is not benzene. Benzyl is a benzene ring, CH2, and then that's attached to the oxygen, okay? So what would be the name of this ether? If that's benzyl, you still have to name the substituent on the right. Great. This is benzyl, propyl. Ether. Okay. One more example of substituents. What if my substituent is a cyclic alkane? Okay. Here we have what is the name of that cyclic alkane? <clears throat> the one that is three carbons and it looks like a triangle. What is the name of that alkane? The cyclopropane. If you have in an ether a cyclic system as a substituent, then what you say is that instead of saying, oh, this is cyclopropane, you remove the ane ending and put YL. This is a cyclopropyl group. So what would be the name of this ether? Great. This is cyclo propyl. Iso propyl ether. Okay. So be conscious about the different substituents that we can have in an ether. Okay. Let's now at least talk about the properties. Or are there any questions before I proceed?
Great. So when it comes to files, we're not going to learn to name files, but at least I want to discuss what are the properties of files. And we saw um, some uh, of the important file structures that we have in the body. For example, amino acids, which are important subunits that make up the proteins in the body, they can have files, okay? But more importantly, as we know, thiols are going to contain sulfur in it, a carbon chain uh, next to that, the SH group. Other than having thiols specifically in protein structures, many of the odors that may be gross to some people, because I am going to accept it out of this picture, I don't think anything is gross, okay? Cheese, love it. Onions, love it. Garlic, that is my preferred condiment ever. Ooh. I eat a lot of garlic. A lot. Love it. Garlic confit, my God. Garlic bread, yes. Especially has some vegan Parmesan cheese on top. Cheesy garlic bread. Whew. Over some tomato salad with good basil. Ooh. Yes, oysters. Okay. So um, if you guys go, um, well, if it's a fishy odor, it's not good, right? But understand that that what we call fishy smell, um, it's actually because of the sulfurs that are released by um, like uh, the ocean, like that is just a, an odor because there's sulfur around. Um, there's actually sulfur mines. Have anybody um, have gone to a, a sulfur mine? I have never gone, but I'm like, oh my God, it has to be super stinky. Wait, what? Where's that deal? Okay, I need to go there. What, Whole Foods? Like I just buy them and then I have to crack them open at home? 12 oysters for $12. Like for example, tonight, oh, they can do it for me? You know what? Thank you for the tip. So for example, I don't know who lives in, you know, up here in San Marcos Vista area. Um, I live closer to Oceanside. On Thursdays, I don't know who I've gone, put a one in the chat. My favorite ever in the world, Thursday night, going to Sunset Market, put a one in the Sunset Market, best market. I don't know who has gone, but oh my God, that market at night has delicious food. One of them is the oyster guys. They have oysters, they have um, baked oysters. No, grill them, they grill them, they don't bake them. They grill the oysters. Oh, they have uni. Yes, Rafiki's is super good. The arepas, yes. I usually go that. Uh, the Belgium guy with the fries, yes. And then they have all kinds of good desserts too. Like you can get the mariposa ice cream. They have good ice cream. If you feel like uh, macarons, there's the lady that sells the macarons. So good. Oh, their ginger tea is what I've been taking. They have live music, yeah. My son loves the pizza. Like that pizza can feed at least two people, but he eats it by himself. I have not tried the mini donuts. Yeah, they have ginger tea. The, the, the lady that sells the macarons, I'm telling you, if you have never been and you have transportation and you want to explore food, go to Sunset Market. So good. So anyways, going back to the oysters. Hmm, maybe I should go tonight and see the oyster guys they they have grilled oysters so good so good but anyways when you have those um uh smells for some people they they don't stand the the smell of you know the cheese the oysters the garlic but it's because of the sulfurs in it okay um for example i personally at times dive in into vegan cooking and I noticed online that people were buying this black salt. Um, 
And I was just interested in, no, that I don't think that that's what causes the tears in the onions. It's not the sulfur. I, I really don't know the answer to that. I know that um, there's something, the tear ducts get activated, but I don't think it's the sulfur. I don't know. Um, there's this black salt that is utilized in vegan cooking that it will imitate like the taste of um, eggs or fish or all that kind of stuff. And when I look at the packaging and I look at the chemical formula of the salt, because it is an ionic compound, I was like, oh, it has sulfur. That's why um, it's utilized. Very interesting. So understand that all of these are there. Now, there's some chemical compounds that have sulfur that are really disgusting. <laughs> As you can see, skunk spray. Yes, that has sulfurs in it too, okay? And they have a mixture of thiols. So if you scare a skunk and they spray you, yes, they're putting a whole bunch of uh, thiols on you. So... <laughs> the heart emoji and the skunk spray. That's a good one. But anyways, when it comes to thiols, understand that these compounds are produced naturally. The main thing is like they have very strong odors. Some of them, as you can see, they're not pleasant. Again, for some people, um, the skunk spray, um, that one for sure, never good, never good. Now, let's talk about solubility before I finish today's class. Now, when it comes to the solubility of these functional groups in water, understand that the solubilities of many of these functional groups in water is going to depend on the number of carbons that you have present in these molecules. A rule of thumb when it comes to organic chemistry and solubility is that if you have three or less carbon atoms for some functional groups, and here, for alcohols, for ethers, for thiols, that is true. Things are going to be soluble in water. If you have four carbon atoms, then they're slightly soluble in water. So you will see that they're not as soluble. Five carbons or more, solubility goes down. Now, if we're talking about um, alcohols and ethers, you can see that the relationship, and you can see the one for alcohols on the top, and why is it that, again, three carbons or less are very soluble in water, is because alcohols and ethers will be able to hydrogen bond. Thiol's hydrogen bonding is not as strong <clears throat> because, again, the hydrogen is not bonded to oxygen, in that case, is bonded to sulfur. So hydrogen bonding is really technically not really observed um, in those systems. But in the case of ethers of three carbons or less, or alcohols of three carbons of, uh, or less, they're soluble in water because they're able to hydrogen bond with water molecules, okay? Now, you can see it in the textbook, there's a table, 12, table 12.1. 12 it gives you the solubility for alcohols specifically. But just know that that rule of thumb, three or less, soluble in water, four, eh, slightly soluble, five or more, insoluble in water, okay? Now, phenols are very interesting when you put them in water. Phenols are actually six carbons, okay? And because there are six carbons at first, you will think, oh, they're not completely, they're not soluble in water at all. It has six carbons, but that's not true because phenols are actually very special out of the alcohol family, even though they have six carbons. And again, the six carbon lives in the benzene ring. One of the things is that phenol can hydrogen bond with water, but the preferred way of phenol to interact with water is by doing an acid-base reaction. In that acid-base reaction, 
fellow will be acting as an acid. Water is going to be acting as a base. So since water is acting as a base, it's going to produce hydronium, okay? Because now water has an extra um, hydrogen. That phenol is going to create a phenoxide ion and see that this reaction is reversible. So when you put phenols <clears throat> in water, this is the only alcohol that is able to do this that has six carbons. If you have hexanol, hexanol cannot do this. It's only phenol. Phenol will be able to create that phenoxide ion and its slight solubility in water is because phenols are actually slightly acidic compared to other alcohols, okay? And as you can see, what we create is the phenoxide ions. Where do we see phenols being used? As antiseptics. If sometimes, and for those of you that have parents or for those of you that at home have younger siblings and they are prone to like ear infections and stuff, when you look at the ingredients for some of the antiseptics for ear stuff, sometimes you see phenol in it just because it is utilized, okay? Any questions about the solubility of water for alcohols, ethers, thiols, and out of the alcohols, phenols specifically? Well, this is all for today.